Okay, week two, lecture two, um, continuing with the spleen. It's located in the posterior lateral aspect of the left upper quadrant. The size is variable, but basically um, you've learned that the upper limits of normal is 13 centimeters. But basically it should be about the size of the kidneys. So if the kidneys are between 9 and 12 centimeters, the way you sort of gauge whether or not the spleen looks enlarged is if it's a lot larger than the left kidney. So again, the upper limits of normal is 13 centimeters, but again, it should be very um, even in size with the kidney. Transducer selection, 3.5, 5 megahertz to begin, highest frequency possible. Um, what are some variants? There's accessory spleen. They may be born without a spleen, asplenia. And there's not necessarily lab values that are specific to the spleen, but we always look at hematocrit if there's a bleed, um, and we look to see if they might be septic, things like that. So patient prep, there is none. Um, <clears throat> Patient position, again, anything goes, as long as you document the position on the, on the films. Sonographically, it should be homogeneous medium level echoes equal to the kidney or slightly less echogenic than that of the liver. So it's a little bit darker than the liver, more equal to the cortex of the kidney. So um, they'll sometimes ask you on the registry to put the organs in order the, um, of highest echogenicity to the lowest echogenicity. So a couple more images showing you an accessory spleen and what that would look like. And again, all of this should be review. Indications. Um, again, where you're going to find all of the indications is, and what you should be doing, is going to the AIUM guidelines for each organ and looking up all the indications and the recommendations for scanning. So some of the more common indications for a spleen exam would be a palpable spleen felt on an exam, felt enlarged, <clears throat> right upper, I'm not right upper, left upper quadrant pain. Um, infectious disease, elevated lab values that might um, lead towards a bleed. And then again, refer to the guidelines and the book on page, like I said, 199. <clears throat> in some editions, it might be a different um, page number in the newer editions. Thyroid. It's a butterfly-shaped endocrine gland lying anterior to the trachea in the anterior portion of the neck. The isthmus is the piece that connects the right and the left lobe at the level of the second, third, and fourth tracheal rings. Okay, Blood supply is primarily through the superior and inferior thyroid arteries and veins. And the parathyroid glands are going to be situated superiorly, inferiorly, and medial. And you can always refer back to your cross-sectional notes on that as well. <clears throat> the size is about four to six centimeters in length, each lobe. The AP measurement is about one and a half centimeters, the width about two to three. The isthmus is small, usually between two and six millimeters. And often we won't see the parathyroid glands unless there's something going on with them. They are also small, between one and three millimeters. Variations, um, the most common is the pyramidal lobe. And I know right here it's, it's telling you that it's about 15 to 30%. So basically on a lot of sources, you're gonna see something that says like 25% of the population. And these numbers are always going to be in, in somewhat within this range, but you may never find the exact percentage. So you're always going to have to make the best educated guess based on the sources that you've used. And remember, each source has slightly different data, but it still should fit in a, in a pretty obvious range that stands out from the other answer choices. Now, this pyramidal lobe is often 
an extension on, of the isthmus that's more towards the left side, and it's a superior extension. Um, other thyroid conditions, ectopic thyroid, their thyroid is positioned in the chest, behind the tongue. There are various locations that the thyroid may, may have migrated to or not migrated. Um, ectopic parathyroid glands, about 15 to 20%, <clears throat> which means they can be situated just about anywhere. It's not unusual to sometimes see dilated follicles, which makes it look sort of like the um, thyroid has got a Swiss cheesy sort of appearance to it. That's sort of a normal variant. It isn't always associated with any lab values being off, so sometimes that's just more prominent in people. And variable um, shapes, bilobed, multilobed, elongated, and so forth. And here you can see, of course, the pyramidal lab. Lab values. Well, we always look at our T3s and T4s and calcitonin specifically for the thyroid. But a lot of times, if there is elevated um, calcium, serum calcium, and they're suspicious of a parathyroid adenoma, remember they're going to always order a thyroid exam. So it's important that you understand that calcium levels also may be a reason for scanning the thyroid with the focus being the parathyroid. So you would do the normal thyroid anyways and you may or may not find something, but keep in mind, again, you have to have an idea of what you're actually looking for. Um, and that's why you guys are looked at basically as the eyes for the radiologist because you're gonna look at their symptoms or their lab values, and you're already going to have an idea of what you're searching for, and you're actually going to seek that out. And if it's not that, you're going to look for something else. So you are basically essentially playing doctor, and you need to know, again, indications, why we're doing this, what we're looking for. And that's why the registry is so important. Now, patient position, supine with the neck mildly um, hyperextended. I usually have my patients put a pillow under their shoulders, and their neck, but not under their head. And that usually provides a nice surface for scanning. So the pillow should be placed under the patient's shoulders. Uh, transducer selection, higher frequency linear transducer. I would start with the 10, and if you don't get enough penetration, then I would start dropping down from that point. You want to be able to at least see down to the longest coli muscle. <clears throat> Sonographically, the thyroid should be homogeneous, hyperechoic to the surrounding muscles, similar echo texture than that of, to that of the liver. And the parathyroid glands, if they are seen, they're going to be slightly um, hypoechoic. Very small, their shape is variable, um, and they're typically going to be found posterior to the thyroid lobes and anterior to the longus coli muscles. And again, the problem with this one picture is you actually would have to increase your depth or be able to penetrate just a little bit deeper so we can see, you know, the longus coli muscles, which is kind of blackened out here. So when you do your thyroid pictures, I'm going to be very picky. I want you to set your gain settings to the muscle, okay, which is a low-level gray, not to the organ, because remember the organ can have various echogenicities and it will change, but muscle will never change. So if your muscle is blackened out like it is in this picture, I'm definitely going to be marking off because this is the, the time that you're going to try to perfect your pictures um, and get as picky as you, as you can. Indications for an exam, um, palpable enlarged thyroid abnormal labs, any tenderness, um, possibly difficulty swallowing, um, a very common indication for doing a thyroid ultrasound would be a cold nodule that was found in a nuclear medicine study, or any asymmetrical enlargement in the neck. If one side appears to be like it's bulging out, um, that would be an indication for a thyroid. Of course, reference the AIUM guidelines and again, read the book and the protocol um, that correlates to this 
this actual organ. Um, and I'm hoping you're doing all the practice questions in there too because that's where I get most of the questions from. I want you to be doing all the homework and all the, the workbook assignments and so forth. <clears throat> Testicular scrotal exam. So the scrotum is a pouch of skin that's continuous with the abdomen. The median raphe is the exterior division of the scrotum. Internally, um, it's divided into two sacs by a membrane called the, and I don't know if you guys remember um, the name of that. In fact, I might have you, uh, when we do our review, we'll see if anybody can remember what the internal membrane division is, okay? Within the sac, we have the testes, the epididymis, the proximal vas deferens, blood vessels, all that kind of stuff. All right, the size of the testes, three to five centimeters, sagittal, and it should be sort of oblong like an egg, two to three centimeters transverse, three centimeters AP. I don't really care that you know the volume per se, but it's kind of a um, reference point when you're doing measurements, um, the reason the radiologist likes the three measurements is they can actually calculate out a volume. And some radiologists do look at volume measurements. Um, epididymis, we only measure the head, and that's about one and a half centimeters. And I want to remind you, if the epididymis, okay, if this is the testicle like this, and the epididymis is sitting like that. And remember, we don't really see the body um, and the tail much. So when you're doing your measurement, an AP measurement of the head would be like this and like this. You're doing, again, a measurement from here to here. That's an AP measurement. <clears throat> Normal variants, they may have an appendix testy, a small superior structure to the testy. Basically, it's a little, it's functional tissue um, between the epididymis and the testy. 92% are unilateral. Um, appendix epididymis, small little, like I refer to it as sort of like a little skin tag. A lot of times you don't really see it unless the person has a hydrocele. And that's about 30. I don't know where they get these percentages. 34. I don't know why they just don't say 35%. But again, it could be 35%. You're always going to go with the best answer choice. <clears throat> that's a little appendix testy right here. It is actual functional testicular tissue. Congenital anomalies, cryptorchism, which is undescended testicles, 80% are going to be located in the inguinal canal, and 10 to 25% are bilateral. They can have an ectopic testicle up in the pelvis region. Um, that's less common. Okay, Anorchia or uh, monoorchism is having more or less. Okay, Missing one or having an additional one. Um, polyorchism, again, is having more than one. So you could either have less, and with this little carrot's indicating, it's usually the left that's more commonly missing if they only have one, okay? And poly, usually you'll just see um, another testicle, but not typically quite the same size as the two uh, native testicles. The third testicle would be slightly atrophy, typically, typically. Um, and this is pretty much what a um, ectopic testicle in the inguinal region would look like. And we can remember when we're dealing with uh, small children, these are tiny. So I sometimes I would use even the vaginal probe, mainly because it had the higher frequency, much higher frequency than any of the other options. So you're going to use either the linear or even perhaps sometimes the vaginal probe to get good definition and prove that is, in fact, the testicle. Sonograph herons, homogeneous, medium-level echoes, uh, similar to that of the thyroid. We talked about in class the pampiniform plexus, right? That's the network of veins along the spermatocord. 
The mediastinum testes is the echogenic band that courses and invaginates through the testicle where all the vessels enter and exit. The epididymis head um, okay, is larger than the body and the tail, which we often don't see unless it's enlarged. And the head is situated superior to the testes. And it's typically going to be isoechoic to the testes. So it kind of just sits right there superior to it. And that's, it's the same echogenicity. So here we have the epididymis. OK, and this is just the head. We might have a little cyst here in this picture. This is the mediastinum testes. That's what they're showing you right here, OK? And on this next picture here, here's the head of the epididymis as well. And then we can see a little bit of the body there. That's an unusual finding to see the body like that unless it's enlarged. And I don't think this is enlarged. I think they have pretty good resolution. But that's the epididymis. Patient prep, um, of course, you ask your patient to remove uh, their, all their clothing from the waist down. Um, give them a robe. Tell them to lie on their back. I usually will give them some um, rolled um, towel to place under the scrotum. Again, we want a nice surface to be able to scan the testes without them moving. Um, have them hold their penis back or place another towel on top of the penis so it's over to the side. Um, and they say, you know, in the book, this is saying use a folded towel to hold the penis in place like a belt. I've even seen them say tape the penis back, but we're not going to do anything. That's typically not going to be an issue. Um, and then try to make sure you're covering your patient with a sheet at all times and only expose the areas that you need to. OK, so their legs should be covered. Only expose the, the scrotal sac. Uh, transducer selection about, again, 5 to 10 megahertz is the range, always starting with the 10 megahertz first and dropping down as needed. Um, this is sort of a visual of um, how they're just kind of showing you the, the different parts and the different cuts of the testicle and the way it should typically lie. You know, the um, epididymis is, lies mostly overall posterior and lateral. I don't know if you guys remember that, but you'll need to. If they ask about the head specifically, that's superior. Okay, the tail they might say is, is inferior. But overall, it's a posterior lateral. So we look for indications that are leading us towards different kinds of conditions. If like just the back of the scrotal sac is uh, red, hot, and tender, then we're looking for epididymitis. So again, we did this in small parts. And you want to make sure you revisit that. And you know, you're going out there in the field. Now's the time to remember everything you were taught and put it, put it into practice. <clears throat> and here's another view. Indications. Um, and again, we've talked about many, and these are only listing a few. You're going to refer to the AIUM guidelines, as always. But any kind of scrotal pain, any enlargement, maybe the patient feels a palpable mass. Um, if it's a young child, cryptorchism, um, undescended testicles, right? Um, trauma is the reason they'd most likely come in through the emergency room. Um, and male infertility, there's different things we would look for. So as always, review the AIUM guidelines and review the protocol as indicated in your book. Now, breast is a little bit different. Um, remember, we don't do these for screening purposes. We usually do these for diagnostic purposes following a mammogram. Ultrasound is not usually the first modality of choice a uh, mammogram would be. Okay, So the breast anatomy, um, obviously, the breast, the whole function is to pr produce milk. Um, and lactate uh, after pregnancy. What we're looking for, again, is pathology, which is most commonly going to be in the mammary layer, because that's the parenchymal tissue. That's where the acini glands are. 
the lobules we call the TDLUs, the ducts. Um, the stromal elements are all the um, non-functional tissue, the supporting structures like the Cooper's ligaments, the fat, um, any structural stuff, but not the actual functional tissue. Areola is the dark pigmented portion of the nipple, and out of the nipple is, again, where the functional part that's for the release of milk. The layers which we should be aware of and be able to point out sonographically, include the subcutaneous layer, which is going to be typically a, a fairly thin layer of just skin. And in some people, there's some fatty tissue. But often, it's a very thin layer of fatty tissue. Um, the mammary layer, that's where the TDLUs are, the connective tissue. You'll see Cooper's ligaments, fibroglandular tissue, the lactiferous ducts are probably the only part of the TDLU you're going to see because the acinis are small and microscopic. Um, that's the functional portion of the breast. And then, of course, we have the retromammary layer. Um, very rarely is there any fatty tissue there either. There's going to be a lot more fat in the mammary layer. Um, you're going to see the muscle, pectoralis muscle, the deep fascia. That's going to be um, lining the fascia lining of the muscle, so it's going to appear very bright. So you're going to know the mammary layer from the mammary layer because you'll see that bright, deep fascia lining. And then, of course, there's going to be ribs and cartilage that we certainly don't want to mistake for a mass. <clears throat> and again, you can see the TDLUs. And hopefully, I'm not going to ask you to label stuff in this class, but hopefully you do remember the different parts of the tissue, especially the ultrasound views. So sonographically, the Cooper's ligaments are going to be very echogenic, bright bands coursing through the, the breast. Fat is going to be hypoechoic. And if you remember from um, abdomen 2, we talked about our gain settings are going to be set to fat. So you want to make all your adjustments to fat. Um, because that's the part of the, the tissue that doesn't change, that doesn't usually go through any functional changes. Whereas the parenchymal tissue, that's usually medium gray, a bit brighter than that of fat. But over time, it becomes fatty replaced and very isoechoic to fat. So we want to set our gain settings to fat lobules. And then the lactiferous ducts are going to be anechoic and tubular, taking a course towards the nipple. And like I said, this is probably the only picture you'll ever get where the breast tissue is so well defined and pointed out. You can see the three layers clearly, subcutaneous. See this bright fascia here? This is the deep fascia below that. So the mammary layer is basically sandwiched between two fascia linings. Down here, you've got a rib with shadowing. You've got cartilage. Beyond that is the lungs. You can see the pectoralis major and minor muscle. Okay, But again, you'll never see breasts that quite looks like this. You're going to see breasts that are going to look more like this. Okay, Still, the mammary layer is pretty well defined. You can see the anechoic tubules here that um, are the lactiferous ducts. You can see just those portions of them, the little anechoic areas. And then other breast tissue is going to look very much like this. Lots of fat, very large. You're going to have to um, use. And the reason it's not a good scanning tool is because when you have a large breast, you'd be there all day long looking at little teeny tiny areas at a time. Um, it's very time consuming. And it's very easy if you're not trained and you haven't done a lot of breasts to make mistakes and think you see a mass when you don't. So that's why they require that you have scanned at least 400 breasts before you can take the breast registry. And you probably shouldn't do a whole lot of scanning of breasts, not in a breast center, unless you do have your, your breast registry. Patient position, uh, supine with the ipsilateral arm raised up above their, so basically above or behind their head. Okay. That kind of gives the breast surface sort of a flat, like you want to kind of flatten it out like a pancake uh, kind of thing. So it's flat like a clock surface. 
Um, sometimes we have to roll the patient slightly over, put one of those little wedges in so that it's again got a nice flat surface. Um, scanning technique, we're going to mentally divide the breast into evenly spaced sections. Um, it could be quadrant, and then we're going to view it, like we said, the face of a clock, so we can pinpoint and accurately communicate where we're seeing something. We want to be able to pinpoint the location. So hold the transducer perpendicular to the radial axis of the breast. The reason we talk about doing radial and anti-radial is because that's the way the TDLUs grow. And if we're going to comment on things like the growth is taller than it is wide, um, it's best to be lined up with the growth of the TDLU to accurately um, communicate that and show that. So, and it's also important to make sure you're, you're scanning as far down as the chest wall. And if you are, you'll know it because you'll see the lungs. You'll see the movement in the lungs. So just a little reminder of how the breast is broken up into quadrants and clock method the right versus the left. Two o'clock on the right breast is different than two o'clock on the left breast as far as quadrants are going. Two o'clock on the right breast is an inner quadrant, but two o'clock on the left breast is an outer quadrant. So just make sure you're looking at both of them as a surface of a clock. Then when you're doing your surveying, it's okay to do sagittal and transverse when you survey. But as soon as you see something, you need to line up with the TDLU, and that's when we start to do the radial anti-radial. So radial is along the face of the clock. Anti-radial is 90 degrees to the clock face. It's the transverse of the radial. And we also talked about, because you've been writing some um, technical impressions on breast, and we talked about it, so it's important to reference uh, in centimeters how far it is from the nipple. Sometimes we actually get a ruler out and measure it. Other times people use their finger width as a centimeter and say it's so many finger widths from the breast or so many centimeters from the, the breast nipple. And then we always refer to um, the skin depth as usually A being the subcutaneous layer, B usually the mammary, and C is the chest wall. I'm looking at this picture here, and I don't know why it's saying A, B, and C, and then it's showing you down here the muscle. Oh, that's a rib. Okay, that's down. Still, that would be included in the C um, bracket. So basically, C would include all this part down here. So they're showing you in the two images, and we've done this before, too, in this first picture. On the right, this is one centimeter from the nipple. Of course, we would say that that's about five o'clock, one centimeter from the nipple, and it is in the mammary layer, or we would indicate B, saying mammary layer. So one centimeter, right, from the nipple, it's at about five o'clock, five o'clock, one B. Saying 1B is telling us 1 centimeter from the nipple, B in the mammary layer. And then on the left breast, we're looking at it that looks like it's about 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2C, over near, very deep, close to the chest wall, next to the muscle and the ribs, or maybe even in the muscle. So again, saying C is down deep near the chest wall. Proper annotation, left or right breast, using the clock as a reference, distance from the nipple in centimeters, and we said ABC, again, according to the depth, position of the transducers, radial or anti-radial. Um, visit the AIUM suggested guidelines or indications as well as guidelines, and of course the protocol, which is, is there really isn't a protocol other than how you document it and how you label it. It's basically follow up from a mammo. Um, we don't do the entire two breasts. That's not typically how breasts are done. So as you read through there, they'll, they'll talk about indications and why we would do it and how we go about doing it.
Okay, so that's the end of lecture for week two.